Yeah. 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 I think we'll start the next session. And before we start the session, I would not miss an opportunity to introduce Apurva because we have been hearing him and he's been a part of uh, relaying the presentation of Dr. Uh, Vivek Debroy. Apurva is also a very active member of the Railway Enthusiast Society. And uh, he actually has worked behind the scenes for running this conference. Uh, he is the ultimate rail photographer and would go to any lengths to not only photograph our trains, but also delve into the history of the railway lines that the trains run on. Uh, his knowledge on the rail network beyond Pune and Bhorghat is phenomenal. We just saw Nuthan Tunnel as an example. Okay, so we start the next session. Uh, the next session is uh, by Mr. Achal Khare, who is the former MD of NHRCL. When I was in Southeastern Railway, he used to be the DRM of Chakradharpur Division. Uh, his moderator today is our president, Mr. Vinu Mathur. And uh, once again, I'd like to give a brief introduction about Vinu Mathur. He is a professional railwayman man who retired from railway service as a member of the Indian Railways Board. He was from the Indian Railways Traffic Service and retired as member traffic. Apart from being a professional railway man, his real love has been delving into the history of the railways and penning his thoughts and ideas. His book, Bridges, Buildings and Black Beauties of Northern Railway, is a phenomenal collection of photographs and information about the buildings in Northern Railway. And he's now working on his next book, which is on rail architecture. He is one of the founder members of the Rail Enthusiast Society, and of course, the president of the society today. Over to you, Vinu. Thank, thank, thank you, Manoj. I have great pleasure in introducing our next speaker, Achal Khare, who belongs to the Indian Railway Service of Engineers. He had his education at Rudki University from where he graduated. Rurki, Rurki Engineering College was the, is the oldest college engineering uh, institution in India and currently known as the Indian Institute of Technology, Rurki. After passing out from there, he had a short stint with the Engineers India Limited and thereafter joined the, the railways. In his initial years, he spent a lot of time in the field uh, looking after maintenance of track in construction projects, particularly the construction of a new coach building plant. He then spent a, a, a period with the Udhampur uh, Sirinagar Baramula rail project, which has a number of challenges, particularly since the mountain rock is very fragile, of building tunnels and bridges. So most of that alignment is on tunnels and bridges. So that was a really a very challenging engineering uh, task, which is still in progress. He later joined IRCON, and in IRCON, he got his overseas experience, where uh, he had an, uh, 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 he spent some time in Brazil, and later became the team leader of the IRCON team in uh, Malaysia, where they built a, 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 a brand new electrified uh, track. As was mentioned, he has worked at DRM Chakradharpur, which is a very busy division. He spent some time in the railway board as uh, advisor uh, 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 infrastructure, where he dealt with a number of projects, whether it be the DFCCIL, the public-private partnership initiatives, the high-speed rail project. He later on became the first managing director of the National High Speed Rail Corporation and uh, uh, spent a, a fair amount of time there. He established the work culture and values of that organization and uh, very competently led the organization in a way that today we find the project being implemented in the field. He is a very competent engineer. And I, I, I do recall because I've attended a lot of meetings with him. He has been able to provide uh, technical solutions to issues. And he has been a very good negotiator with his Japanese counterparts who are the consultants for the project. 
So we look forward to the session because Achal Khare will be able to give us a very good perspective about the high-speed rail all over the world in India and what is its future. I now invite Achal to make his presentation. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, a very good afternoon to many of my seniors, many distinguished uh, uh, people who are there in this conference. So thank you very much, sir, for giving me this opportunity. I would uh, straight go to sharing my uh, screen with the presentation. Is it visible? Yes, it's visible. Okay. I'll just go to the... Right. So, I think I'll straight go to the second slide. This is what I'm intending. What is the global experience about high speed? So, a little bit about development and sustainability, environmental friendliness of high speed. Since... Uh, uh, Mathur sir has introduced much more about me, which probably I may not deserve. But still, I was dealing with the Mumbai Ahmedabad high speed project. So something about MAHSR and then how specifically Mumbai Ahmedabad high speed project is going to help India uh, by way of new technology, by way of economic benefits. And what are the future scenario of high speed in India? So high speed global experience, this is a linear diagram. If you see high speed came to world in 1964 with Japanese starting Shinkansen uh, in October, followed by France in 1981. I will not read the entire thing. Uh, you may see a big jump came when uh, uh, China started doing it in 2008. And now uh, till 2018, I think the last one to be added was Saudi Arabia. And uh, we may see further in next couple of years, Indonesia, India, and US uh, getting the high speed. Uh, these are uh, some glimpses. Uh, uh, maybe some numbers may not be as accurate, but 1964, it all started with uh, Japan uh, running the Shinkansen. As of now, about 56,000 kilometers of high speed exists, mostly in China, about 4,000 plus uh, train sets. Maximum speed, which was tested, world record is by France, 574.8 kilometer. The current revenue operation is around 320 kilometer per hour. And as you may see, uh, lot of people are traveling by high speed on an average uh, a distance covered by a high speed passenger is around in the range of 400 kilometer so total about 1029 billion passenger kilometer per year are being traveled by high speed there is a breakup uh, country wise again highest in is, is in china followed by japan then france what is interesting to note is uh, high speed travel, if it is up to two hours, 30 minutes, less than 2.5 hours, about 80% modal split is seen with respect to uh, air transport, which means uh, air transport traffic shifts to high speed in case the travel time is around two hours, 30 minutes. Now, why do we talk about high speed? Uh, uh, this is a study which was done by UIC in 2008. There are certain external costs to the cost of transport. I have given a small definition of external costs. External costs are generated by the transport users, but these are those costs which are not paid by them. These are actually paid by the society as a whole, and these include cost of accidents, air pollution, noise, climate change, etc. And if you see this chart, High speed rail passenger are the lowest with respect to external costs. So uh, in that respect, this is highly sustainable, sustainable mode of transport. Something to talk about uh, environmental issues. So again, here, if you see, this is what I have picked up these numbers from a study uh, by ADBI. Now here also you see high speed has the lowest carbon dioxide emission 
and the highest is that of plane. Now, this is something interesting. Uh, I found that in Spain, uh, uh, the, uh, the high speed operators, they put this kind of numbers uh, on their ticket uh, and which shows uh, uh, for a travel from Madrid to Barcelona, these numbers of, are of 2015. I picked it up from one of the brochure of UIC. Now, again, if here you see the primary energy consumption for high speed is much less with respect to car or with respect to air, aeroplane. So by these two slides, I just wanted to highlight that it is highly environmental friendly mode of transport, high speed, when you compare it with other modes of transport. With that, I'll come to brief of MHSR project. Uh, if you look at this, uh, the project is between Mumbai to Sabarmati, about 508 kilometer with 12 stations. Uh, on the consideration of safety, as well as to reduce the land acquisition, most of the alignment is on viaduct, about 460 kilometer. We have a very unique feature of uh, a 21 kilometer long tunnel uh, in the vicinity of Mumbai out of which about seven kilometer is under the sea, Thane Creek. So total travel time from Mumbai to Sabarmati with high speed, with limited stop, uh, stop services is expected to be two hours, seven minutes. And with all stop is two hours, 58 minutes. There are total 12 stations with the design speed of 350 kilometer per hour and the operating speed will be 320 kilometer per hour. This is just a perspective view how the viaduct will look like, uh, courtesy my Japanese colleague who created this and gave it to us. Uh, again, as I told you, uh, about 90% of the alignment is viaduct. Uh, I would just, uh, there are another slides, but here since 508 kilometer out of that 460 kilometer is to be done in a very, very short time. So, Conventional method which have been deployed so far may not work. We will have to go for full span launching. It's a diagram which indicates that we are acquiring only 17.5 meter of width uh, to accommodate the high speed corridor. This also includes about four meter of service road. Just to give you an idea, nowadays for expressways, uh, NHEI is acquiring anything between 100 to 120 meter of uh, for the uh, six lane expressway against that uh, high speed will require only 17.5 meter of uh, width for the land this is something about train operation plan uh, earlier uh, the project was scheduled to be opened uh, in 2023 so if you see my uh, first column now I think uh, it has been uh, revised to 2026 uh, because of the COVID and uh, certain land acquisition issues, particularly in Maharashtra. So uh, the target will not be 23 now, hopefully it will be 26. And uh, uh, to begin with, we will start with the 10 train configuration. Uh, we expect each direction about 18,000 passengers traveling today. Services will be starting from wow. 6 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock in the morning. Peak hours uh, services will be peak service uh, per hour and off peak will be about two service per hour. This is something related to maintenance because many of my uh, friends might have joined. So I thought let me give something about the maintenance. So we will have two depots, one at Thane, another at Savarmati. We'll have about 30 substations, uh, which includes 12 traction substation, two depot substations, and 16 distribution substations. OHE will be heavy compound catenary, two into 25, signaling digital ATC. I will talk about disaster prevention when I come to the uh, benefits of technology. Then we will have a training institute at Vadodara. The hostel building is already done. 
annual energy requirement uh, is assessed to be around 1100 million units something unique about this train because we will be running about 320 so train acceleration normally it will take 310 seconds a distance of 18 kilometer to reach uh, this speed service braking again 167 second but then power failure detection braking will be about 78 seconds even in this it will travel a distance of about 3.8 kilometer we'll have three types of classes standard business and first class the fare of a standard class is going to be about 3000 rupees which will be slightly slight as of now it is slightly less than the airfare now why high speed in india and how mhsr is bringing a paradigm shift in uh, construction operations and maintenance the whole railway system it is going to bring a kind of paradigm shift how it is going to be there since time is short i'll be rushing though each and every topic has lot many things to be talked about but i will be rushing on this uh, uh, section so first is safety feature the disaster management system which is not there at present neither in metros nor in indian railways improved bogie technology by way of pressurized then we have improved uh, co coaches by way of pressurized car body double skin hollow aluminium car uh, body noise mitigation uh, measures then is very unique pantograph there are uh, uh, things to reduce the air drag and then a very unique feature with japanese technology is this special lurch control then we'll have driver support system a uh, whole lot of uh, signaling thing so digital digital audio frequency track circuit uh, another unique feature which as railway engineer i found is cable gas pressure monitoring system all the signaling cables will be gas filled so as an event some crack even emanates one would know that yes there is a problem in the system and then uh, some cable is going to fall fail so you are able to take action even uh, before the failure actually takes place heavy duty point machine with swing nose crossing same way electrical system uh, the current neutral section where driver is supposed to lower the uh, pantograph will not be there so it is a automatic switched neutral section coming to safety feature of hsr disaster management system so there are four types of natural disasters earthquake uh, variation in temperature wind pressure and and rains sorry yeah so uh, it's a very elaborate arrangement for early detection of the earthquake as we all know earthquake has two types of waves one is the primary wave uh, if you see this diagram another is the secondary wave and the damages are caused by secondary wave the basic idea is that the system should detect the primary wave and before the secondary wave reach the structure where the where the high speed trains are running Uh, we should be able to stop the movement uh, and thereby reduce the effects of the earthquake the earthquake in any case will pass through this but then if you stop the train operation the the damages will be minimized so with that philosophy on M mumbai ahmedabad high speed we are going to put 22 such uh, seismometer uh, at uh, different locations primarily at uh, sub stations and if you all know that uh, the nearby regions which are prone to earthquake are one is the uh, kutch region the bhuj area where we had the earthquake another is the koina region and third is this latur usmanabad so we are going to put seismometer uh, at these locations and these will detect the primary wave and send the signal to the seismometers installed in the project area and then they will eventually go for the emergency braking the power will be switched off and the train operation will be stopped same way rail temperature uh, rail fracture as we all know is a serious issue on indian railways so we are going to install rail temperature monitor uh, with a temperature range minus 5 degree to 70 degree 
and then it will send the signal to operation control depending upon the uh, variation in temperature either reduction in speed can be there or if there is a rail fracture then the train uh, services can uh, will be stopped by the operation control center automatically this is wind mon monitoring if wind uh, speed goes beyond 108 km per hour then the operations will be stopped and uh, after the speeds are reduced we wait for 30 minutes and uh, 30 minutes means it should not happen that we resume the operation and again wind speed increases. So that is the reason why 30 minutes window is given before we resume the train operation. So again at 14 locations uh, such anemometers will be provided. Rain gauge, actually rain is not that big an issue on this project because it's all viaduct is still at the locations where uh, it's a junction of viaduct along uh, with the uh, earthwork, particularly on the approaches of tunnel, there are eight tunnels. Uh, these uh, rain gauges are installed just to monitor the hourly rainfall and 24 hour rainfall and take appropriate action accordingly. Coming to pressurized car body, trains running at such a high speed, all of us would have experienced the, the air travel, uh, some kind of pressure, particularly in the ears. So to avoid that discomfort uh, due to high speed and uh, particularly in the tunnels, the car bodies are kept pressurized. They are made absolutely airtight. This is something unique feature. The car body is made absolute airtight and the pressure inside the car body is kept slightly more than the atmospheric pressure so that the passenger sitting inside doesn't feel uncomfortable even when the train is passing at full speed uh, through the tunnel. For uh, noise as well as uh, uh, for comfort purpose, again, here you see it's a double skin aluminum extrusion shell with which the high speed coaches will be built. This is uh, again few measures which uh, this is a typical E5 series which we are going to get from Japan. So these are typical measures which have been taken. If you see the bogies have been covered, fairings have been provided between the two coaches so that the air in trap doesn't create much noise. And if you see the pantograph, it's a unique pantograph. And again, pantograph is uh, uh, covered with the insulation panel so the no so that the noise generated doesn't go inside uh, and affects the passenger travel. This is very special feature of lurch control. Whenever the train uh, negotiates a curve, we all know because of the centrifugal force, uh, the passenger uh, uh, feel certain kind of lurch, certain kind of thrust, uh, uh, which is a cause of discomfort. So here, it's a special lurch control system. Sensors are provided here on the car body. As soon as it detects, uh, it sends a signal and then, then uh, these vibration prevention measure with electric actuator are, uh, the cylinders are operated in the opposite direction of uh, where uh, the lurch is going to affect. And thus, passengers do not feel uh, the lurch and uh, they remain as comfortable as uh, running the train on a straight track. So driver support system, uh, the cab has entire thing along with the speedometer. It has a driver failure indicator. If the driver wants, he can further uh, see it in a more uh, elaborate manner on display units. So it's a complete uh, uh, driver support system. I'm not going much on this. This is a digital ATC, uh, or, see, uh, automatic uh, train protection and automatic train control. I would have explained this, but, but, but the time is short. That's the reason I'm just rushing through these slides. Uh, the basic concept is that the, the, the digital codes are generated and transmitted through roll, which are picked up by the units provided in the rolling stock. And uh, then uh, the action is taken as per the information sent through these uh, uh, codes transmitted through rail. This is uh, automatic neutral section. Just if you see 
This one has uh, now closed, so it has traveled uh, half the distance, now open, and the second one is closed and it travels again, it passes the full neutral section, and then it goes back to normal. So heavy compound uh, catenary, uh, I don't think this diagram needs much explanation. So uh, DFC has also used a heavy compound catenary, but this one is still heavier because our speeds are much higher. So we have a messenger wire, we have a auxiliary messenger wire, and then we have the contact wire. And contact wire is uh, bigger in size when it is compared to current Indian Railway or uh, or the DFC contact wire. As I told you, uh, fast construction is one of the challenge. There are many other challenges, but I have taken this as one. And a and, uh, good comparison is, I see, I think the Metro in Delhi, the construction started somewhere in 98. And so far, uh, almost after a passage of uh, 22, 23 years, uh, the total network is around 353 kilometers in Delhi. So around 20 years, 20 to 22 years. Against that 508 kilometer out of this 460 kilometer will be viaduct and, and bridges are to be constructed in a period of four, four and a half years. It's a, a small pictorial thing. Uh, around 463 kilometer viaduct, including concrete bridges, 27 steel bridges, eight mountain tunnel, one underground tunnel with undersea portion. And if you see the scale, about 75 lakh tons of cement is going to be used on this project and around 21 lakh tons of steel, reinforcement steel will be used. And this is all to be consumed in a period of four, four and a half years. So we need to go for a, uh, different methods, much faster construction methods. And accordingly, uh, we went for full span launching. This has been very successfully done in China as well as in Taiwan. But in India, uh, uh, MAHSR is going to be the first project to do it. Uh, let me share with you a 40 meter span uh, of high speed is about 1,100 tons. Uh, and this is about 68% heavier than the metro bridges. So we need uh, a different kind of machinery to, to do this full span of uh, full span launching. So already these machines are available uh, on the project. So it's a typical straddle and carrier arrangement where the already laid girder is used to take the new girder over it and then it is launched through these uh, launchers. So it's a straddle carrier arrangement through launchers. Uh, LNT, which is the first contractor on this project, they are trying to do this thing under Make in India. They have already manufactured one such machine and I think they will be manufacturing more such machines. So with this project, not only we are going to get a faster construction uh, experience, we are also going to get an experience of manufacturing such machines in India. Coming to economic benefit, because the type topic was inclusive growth, so it is important for me to show what are the economic benefits uh, which are going to happen because of this project. So this is going to support making India in a big way, transforming infrastructure, upgrading technology. I have already explained it will reduce traffic, it will generate employment, there subsequent slide and environmental friendly transport system. I have explained when I was uh, uh, talking about the world uh, experience. I think this doesn't need much more uh, explanation than this. Coming specific to the project, uh, this slide is particularly prepared as to what benefits are going to occur to Maharashtra. So, what we see is it is going to impact Mumbai metropolitan region in a, in a big way. It is going to reduce the congestion of Western Expressway and Western Central Line. Basic reason, the distance with high speed from Virar to BKC, Bandra Kurla complex, where the station is planned, is going to be only 24 minutes from Virar. From Thane, it is going to be around 11 minutes. And Boisar, it is going to be 37 minutes. These are all suburban area of uh, 
Bombay and in case good transport is provided, these areas are going to see a big boom. As you see, multiple housing and industrial projects are already there in Thane, Boisar and Mewar. And once we are able to give a connectivity with 11 minutes or 24 minutes or 37 minutes, a uh, uh, lot of, uh, lot of uh, interest will be generated uh, in these areas. And uh, as you see, I've given some numbers, Mumbai and the Mumbai suburban, if you see, the persons per square kilometer is very high, almost 20,000 persons per square kilometer. So the idea is in case we have good connectivity from Thane, good connectivity from Vasai and Virar, then lot of people, even though their offices may be in uh, Mumbai area, uh, they may like to move to such areas. Now this is, we picked up, uh, this is one of the news items that uh, almost 5 lakh commuters travel daily from Thane to Mumbai and they spend about 3 to 6 hours daily in traveling. Idea is to give this number uh, because this 3 to 6 hours, now you compare if we have only 11 minute uh, travel time between uh, BKC to Thane, what, uh, what kind of Productivity, we are going to increase uh, for such people who are traveling as high as 5 lakhs in numbers. Another uh, area which is Boisar, Virar, Dhanu and Palghar, which is not a very, uh, Palghar is in fact, is not that, uh, that developed district. But Boisar is a part of Palghar and already there are many industries including BARC, uh, Tata Steel, JSW Steel. Now, once Boisar is so well connected with rest of the Mumbai with only 37 minutes, this area is going to see a big, big boost in terms of economic activities. We also tried to pick up from Maharashtra government side as to how many uh, real estate uh, projects are already sanctioned. So as you can see, 1,690 real estate projects are already approved in Palghar and mostly in Boisar area. And these are a few good, big builders who have approved projects in uh, Thane district. And the primary requirement for these uh, projects to get the boost is uh, good connectivity, which high speed is going to provide that kind of good connectivity, which currently is not there. Now, tourism is another uh, aspect related to high speed and this numbers were again picked up for Maharashtra uh, to this is a 2018 report which says around 11.91 crore uh, domestic tourists visited Maharashtra and 0.5 crore visited uh, uh, foreign visitor uh, came to Maharashtra. They spend about 30 uh, the they spend about uh, sorry the, I come to this they spend about average expenditure is around 2,500. So it translates to approximately 30,000 crore rupees per year being spent by tourists. And a survey uh, with these tourists indicated that only 28% tourists were satisfied but not happy with the availability of transportation. So the idea is with Mumbai Ahmedabad high speed getting connected to the stations of Palghar at Boisar and uh, Virar. Uh, this issue of uh, not as good connectivity is going to be addressed largely and the experience, international experience is that wherever high speed is there, there is an increase of about 20% in tourism for simple reasons. One can go in morning, come back in the evening, spend whole day. So our assessment is a rough assessment is that even this 20% increase is going to translate to about 6,000 crore rupees of additional revenue to the state government. So that is the and, and the kind of jobs it will create. Uh, one can understand that tourism sector, uh, how much jobs it would create for the people of that area. Now this number is something based on uh, during the construction phase, we assess about 90,000 direct and indirect jobs will be created. 
about 58000 direct jobs we are expecting 51000 skilled and unskilled workers and about 7000 engineers and supervisors and as we are going to use huge amount of raw material cement steel and other products we expect that this will also give a, a, a increase uh, create uh, direct jobs of about 34000 uh, people so during the construction phase, we expect a, quite a good number to be employed on this uh, project. Now, I had spoken about Maharashtra, uh, something about Gujarat. This is our uh, project alignment. And as you see, uh, this is passing through major GIDC, Gujarat Industrial Development Corporation Industries cluster uh, of Wapi, Surat, Dahej, Bharu, Sanat, Anand, and Vadodara. And faster connectivity of these stations uh, will give uh, uh, good opportunity to improve the business in this area. Uh, particularly, I may also say that we also have Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor, which is also going to be benefited because of the ease in movement of people and quick movement of people. Coming to the future scenario, this is uh, some numbers uh, which I uh, gathered, uh, particularly in the context of Asia. So Japan was the first one which started uh, operations in 1964. Uh, when they started, uh, the GDP per capita uh, was 843 US dollar. China in 2008, when they started high-speed operation, it was their GDP per capita was 3,468 US dollar. In India, we, we started construction. When I say started construction, we, we did the groundbreaking and we also started doing land acquisition in 2017. So the GDP of India at that time in 2017 was 1,987 US dollar. Now, when we expect to operate high speed in India somewhere in 2026, 27, I've taken a very simple number based on the historic data from 2007 to 2017. India has seen a growth of 6.9%. So applying that, uh, we expect at least a GDP of 3,346 US dollar, maybe more because a lot of uh, emphasis is being given by the government to increase the economy from 2 trillion to 5 trillion. So, uh, what through this slide I'm trying to show is that India is uh, appears to be India at the right time to start this first high speed project. And how many more that will depend as to how uh, things are progressing, the states are growing in India. But this is the right time uh, for India to, to start the high-speed project. Now, let me share that gross domestic, pro domestic project or state domestic project cannot be the only benchmark to decide whether we should have high-speed or not. There are others within uh, the high-growing uh, states or even within the low-growing states. There may be certain cities or a cluster which is uh, growing at a very high, uh, high rate, but at least this becomes a uh, pointer or an indicator as to which are the areas where we should think about going for high speed, taking into other uh, consider points into consideration like the population, like the, the nature of tourism, nature of industrialization. So there are many other things, but in India, if we compare, uh, the Indian GDP stands at around 2,191 USD and there are 19 states or union territories which are higher than this GDP. So these are the potential cases. Of course, in this there will be states like Sikkim or Himachal Pradesh where the GDP is higher than the average, but the population may not be there to support. But uh, this is an indicator that there are many states and within these states, there may be many cities which are knocking at the door for uh, consideration of connecting them with the high speed. 
so that was all the purpose of showing this uh, gdp data uh, state wise and as uh, 19 states and uts are higher than the average of uh, uh, overall average of the country this would be my last slide uh, ministry of railways uh, about 2 years back had decided to take up detailed project report of few other corridors and this these appear in uh, national rail plan also of ministry of railways so uh, nhsrcl has been interested with the job of uh, preparing the detailed project report of these corridors and uh, most of these corridors uh, they are correlated with my previous slides of the state gdp except uh, the two corridors one is uh, delhi varanasi where the up state as a whole has uh, uh, sdp lower than the india average but then as i said there are other considerations if you see this corridor and particularly uh, an airport coming at jaipur and then lot of tourist places like agra lucknow uh, ayodhya varanasi probably a, a detailed study will show that this corridor uh, is uh, equally good when it comes to introduction of high speed so one first is delhi varanasi uh, nhsrcl has already submitted the detailed project report to ministry second one is uh, delhi ahmedabad third is mumbai nagpur fourth is mumbai hyderabad fifth is uh, chennai bangalore mysore then uh, delhi amritsar and uh, uh, seventh one is varanasi to havda uh, i think nhsrcl is going to submit the detailed project report for all these seven corridors uh, during this year and then probably the government will appropriately after looking into the numbers and the, and the financial uh, status of uh, uh, financial requirements of various projects probably government of india would take a call of implementing uh, some of these projects so that is uh, what we see uh, of Uh, future of high speed corridors in india i hope that in near future some of the corridors should see the light of the day i think with that uh, i am through with my presentation thank you very much sir sir unmute us thank you very much it's been a wonderful uh, presentation we have some time for question and answers um let me let me briefly mention what comments have come on chat and in case any of the participants wants to ask a question kindly flip put it on chat um uh, if they uh, and i will also take questions directly now the what has come on chat so far is an excellent presentation full of info and excellent analysis mahendra kumar gupta the same sentiment has been uh, uh, repeated by vemula praveen aditya and himakar uh, uh, tata one of the queries that has been raised is whether there is will be a shorter distance services because you said lot of people from nearby bombay will be wanting to travel by high speed rail so is there any plan for short distance services to bombay bkc you see in my first slide when i was explaining the project we i told that there will be two types of services one is the limited stop and another is all stop and when uh, all stop services uh, will provide this kind of commuter service for the people of boisar virar, uh, virar and uh, thane uh, and uh, there will be a ticketing arrangement and people will be able to travel through these uh, all stop services and let me share with you uh, my expectation is that from thane to bkc the fare will be about 200 rupees only there's another question is when will test run start <laughs> uh, okay uh, i hope uh, you see the original plan was to 
to build a section in Gujarat between Surat and Bilunora. This is about 50 kilometer long section. COVID has affected the things very badly. Otherwise, we were expecting to at least do a limited test run in this section somewhere in uh, late 2023 or early 24 uh, with electrification without signaling. But now things have uh, really uh, affected badly this project. So, uh, but now uh, hopefully if 26 is the opening, at least the test section should start, test run should start one, one to one and a half year before. So somewhere around 2025, you should see the test runs. Another interesting question is, will revenue cover the operational costs? Yes, uh, the, the report which has been given by Japanese to us, uh, it will definitely cover the operational cost. Uh, let me share the numbers of the financial return are around 4%. So it will definitely cover the operational cost. But if we think that it will support the capital cost and the, and the depreciation, I don't think uh, that would be possible with the project. Okay, there's a question on what is the actual cost of construction per kilometer? You see, uh, the, the estimate submitted, uh, I gave the number 1,8,000 crore, but with the currency depreciation, rupee depreciating against uh, Japanese yen, uh, this number, completion cost may be higher. But as of now, I think it should be somewhere around 300 crore rupees per kilometer. And let me share with you, the 300 looks very high number, but I did a lot of uh, homework uh, with respect to NCRTC, the RRTS cost and the metro cost. Even these RRTS and metros, which are 80 kilometer per hour to 120 or 130 kilometer per hour, their cost is in the range of 260 crore to 280 crore rupees per kilometer. So if you compare with that, high speed is quite okay. Okay, I have I have a few questions. How, sure. how soon do you feel that we will be able to indigenize the HSR technology? You identified a number of new alignments that are likely to come up which the government has proposed. So, you know, India has been very good at indigenizing. I mean, whether it was the Swiss coaches, whether it was the Alco locomotive, whether it was, there were the WAG9 locomotives, we have been, we have started manufacturing of new technology in India quite fast. So when do you think we will be able to do this in India or alternatively, do you think we will be able to persuade the Japanese to start manufacturing in India? Uh, uh, the answer is both, sir. Uh, for certain items, uh, we should be able to do it in India. Particularly, let me share, when it comes to track, I think I let me uh, tell everyone in this conference that track is, uh, I can say, is almost indi indigenized. Indian contractors are being engaged to do the track. My Japanese colleagues were uh, very kind enough to organize a very elaborate training arrangement which we are developing at Surat and the entire contractor, workers, supervisors, managers will be trained by the Japanese people here in India and then they will be deployed for slab track construction. It's a very unique kind of uh, ballastless track design. So track is already done. OHE, I feel uh, with this project, we should be able to do it uh, fully uh, indigenized version in the next project. The issue remains with signaling and rolling stock. Now in rolling stock, uh, there is going to be some kind of uh, tie up uh, between Indian companies and the Japanese companies. I can share uh, my Japanese companies and DHEL, BEML, they were in, uh, in discussion with uh, uh, each one of them. And uh, certain uh, arrangement will be made here in India, in one of the units uh, where uh, the things will, brought, will be brought in knockdown condition and six train sets we are planning that they will be assembled, tested and commissioned here. So in a limited way, something will be done for rolling stock here in India. Otherwise, most of the things will come from Japan for simple reason, because these are not being produced in India. 
Now coming to the indigenization and the second question of whether Japanese would be willing, we had discussion, though it is too premature to, to say yes or no on this, we had discussion, but we also realized being as the Indian partner that certain numbers are required to be given on an annual basis to make it commercially viable, whether they come in joint venture or they set up here in India. We need certain numbers and this number is around 150 to 200 uh, coaches every year. Now, one, one Mumbai Ahmedabad is not going to support these numbers unless we have two, three such corridors. Uh, only then these numbers will be supported. So my answer to the question is, it depends if the government of India decides to implement two, three more corridors, probably Indian side would be in a position to persuade either for the technology transfer or if not, then at least a joint venture the way we are doing uh, other uh, locomotive projects, uh, things here in India, in Madhepura, in Marora. So I'm expecting if two, three more corridors come up uh, in uh, near uh, three, four years, probably we will see manufacturing of rolling stock in India. And the same thing applies uh, for uh, the signaling thing. Now signaling system, again, most of it is not being produced here in India. I told gas field cable, the point machines, a whole lot of things is not being done here in India. So economy of scale will decide whether on these two things we will have to import the thing or uh, indigenization would be possible. Okay, I think there one question is, uh, to what extent are Japanese willing to share technology with India? I think you've already answered that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, the other 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 question, which was, uh, how do do costs compare in India with what has been done in Japan? Oh, Japan made a conscious effort to reduce costs by standardization and so on. Yeah, uh, in fact, this cost is much less, and uh, I, I think uh, if my Japanese colleagues are listening in this conference, we had to do a lot of head scratching how, as to how to reduce the cost and. Uh, uh, let me share uh, the international cost. If I take various uh, railways constructed, uh, China is definitely uh, lesser than 300 crore. China would be in the range of, uh, see, exact numbers is difficult to tell. I think I saw Mr. Jeet Sondi, he would be the right person to share. But China is less. The reason is economy of scale uh, there. Uh, but other than China, all other countries, whether it is Korea or Taiwan or even in Europe, the costs are much higher. They are in the range of 400 crore rupees per kilometer against ours being 300 crore rupees per kilometer. Okay, let me put in a last question. Uh, you have answered so many. Uh, Joydeep Datta, you wanted to ask a question. Please go ahead. Yeah, I, I just have two small questions. Why you need to bring up uh, undersea tunnel to come into Bombay, couldn't the whole flyover fly across the city and come to a terminal? Sorry, I didn't get your question. Instead of coming through an undersea tunnel, uh, okay, why, why, why not a flyover uh, come through? Okay. The, the answer is environmental considerations. Okay. You see, uh, I didn't cover it up in so much of detail. Hmm. Uh, Thane Creek, which we are crossing, you are very right. Uh, one could have built a viaduct and uh, uh, over the creek and then uh, come to BKC. But hmm. then there is a flamingo sanctuary. It's a protected wildlife area. It's a wildlife sanctuary. And okay. a viaduct construction would have disturbed this sanctuary a lot. Oh. So Thank that's you. the reason we have gone for tunnel and in tunnel also we have gone for tunnel boring machine construction. We are not doing drilling and blasting there to protect the wildlife sanctuary, flamingo or bird sanctuary there. So do you think there will be any uh, uh, rolling stock, spin-offs of the rolling stock from high HSR into Indian railways, normal Indian railways? See, technology any, any technology which comes to India... Uh, in another three, four years, once high-speed trains start running, definitely I see a lot of things uh, which will be seen, understood and adopted on Indian railways, Vande Bharat or other new designs. For example, this large control thing. This is something probably our boy, our people can study and then try and implement this, uh, this thing in India. Same way track construction, same way 
today we don't have aluminium double skin shell uh, but maybe uh, later on we may find double skin shells uh, also in india being uh, manufactured right now double skin shells in dalco is the only company they are not uh, and they were not interested for such a limited uh, quantity to produce uh, double skin shell but i am pretty sure that once mumbai ahmedabad high speed starts running lot of technology Uh, proliferation will take place on indian railways as well as on metro railways oh that thank you sir thank you very much okay let me put my last question and then we stop should india not be take doing a leap frog and going into maglev and hyperloop instead of high speed high speed rail at this stage sir uh, Magle- uh, hyperloop i am not in a position to comment because it is yet to see any commercial operation world over as far as my knowledge goes but if yes if it comes through definitely it is a, is a absolutely wonderful thing which will happen to the uh, the entire world coming to the maglev sir uh, again uh, based on my knowledge uh, the only section which is commercially available is a very limited length 35 km in china what we are going to see is in Uh, real commercial operation it will be in japan somewhere in 2027 uh, maglev and it is quite expensive sir i am putting it very candidly even for mumbai and ahmedabad you have been the part of the team and many more other colleagues we know what kind of resistance we faced with respect to the cost so maglev is going to be again very exorbitantly high cost so currently even if we adopt and do the this technology which we are bringing for mumbai and ahmedabad and adopt it for three four more corridors probably india would have done its bit okay i i uh, achal thank you very much for a very informative very useful talk you have got a lot of praise for for the very analytical details that you have given during the session uh, thank you very much for participating and this wonderful talk Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my views with all of you. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks a lot. Back to you, Manoj. Uh, yes, it was really a very lovely talk by Achal, and uh, of course, very well moderated by Vinu because the questions were also very relevant, and uh, it really fitted in with the theme of the conference that is railways of the future. Uh, thank you, Achal, once again, and. Uh,